Okay, well, as I was telling some of the early comers, my job is to keep you guys here until it's lunchtime, which means I'm fighting against your hunger, but I'm okay with that. So don't worry, we'll end right on time. Um, I'm Taylor Thomas, and the talk today is called Mind the Gap Between the Future and the Present. If you've not heard that term before, that is a picture of the London Underground, um, and or the tube, right? And I still have very clear memories of being there. And anytime I go there and you have the mind the gap between the train and the platform. And the whole idea here is, is kind of that, that warning. We have to mind the gap between where we are now and where we're going in the future. So that's kind of the theme of this talk. But first, a little bit about who, who I am. Now, this picture of me is, speaking of AI, since there's been a couple of those conversations here, this was a cursed picture created by my coworker because I do a lot of Rust, and so the Rust's logo is a crab, and so she asked an AI to do this, and it's just slightly off, and I love it. So um, slightly cursed, cursed a funny picture of me. But I'm an engineering director uh, at Cosmonic. It's a startup working in the WebAssembly space. Um, I am a serial open source contributor and Wasm Cloud maintainer. We're going to talk about that project a little bit today. Like I mentioned, I'm a Rustation. I did a lot of Go before. I, I mean, I touch a little bit of everything, but those have kind of been my primary languages. Now, I also have a long history in the Kubernetes space. Now, I'm not telling you this. I don't generally like to kind of brag about this or talk about these things, but it's important to understand where I'm coming from in, this co in the context of this talk. So I did Kubernetes platforms before Kubernetes platforms were a thing at... Uh, Intel, and then Nike, and then I helped build AKS at Microsoft. Um, and then I'm also a um, Helm core maintainer, Emeritus, so I, I'm no longer a core maintainer, but I wrote a large chunk of Helm 3 with several of my other uh, friends and maintainers on, on that project. Uh, for those who are in the Kubernetes space a lot and you've used Helm, I was the one who wrote the wait flag, which either makes you want to hate me or you love me. Uh, either one of those is completely fair. And I was the co-creator of a project called Crustlet, which was one of the first uh, projects to put WebAssembly and Kubernetes together back in 2019. So I come from a huge background in both Kubernetes, WebAssembly, and so on. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk a little bit about what's it like to run WebAssembly now. Um, then we're going to talk a little about containers, Kubernetes, Wasm, oh my. Um, and then this idea that I'm calling wrapped versus alongside, and then also some demos to show how all of this is going to work. Now, before we move on, I'm curious, it's a small crowd in here, um, but how many of you have used WebAssembly either in the browser or on the server side before? Anyone here? Okay, so two, two three people. That seems to track with the numbers I've seen before. So that, that seems to be about right. So we're going to talk a little bit about WebAssembly and understand kind of the steps of, of everything that's, that is entailed with WebAssembly. So I just wanted to hit off the bat just so people know, like, you might have thought, okay, WebAssembly is cool, but it's kind of new. It's actually way uh, ubiquitous. It's in a lot of places you wouldn't expect it to be. So there's a couple different ways you can run Wasm, and we've seen Wasm run in production right now uh, in the wild. And that's directly with runtimes like Wasm Time, Whammer, Wasm Edge, uh, which is a CNCF project. And then we have plugins and extensions is a common thing. You'll see this in Envoy, Cilium, uh, user-defined functions and databases. Many of them will offer WebAssembly plugin models at that point. Um, you'll also see a lot of serverless and FAS type uh, workloads, so Fastly, Fermion and Spin, Cloudflare, those kind of things. You'll also see a lot of integrations with c uh, containers and Kubernetes. So you have RunWASI, which we'll talk a little bit more about, ContainerD, Shim, KWASM, and then you have different application platforms and runtimes, which are like Wasm Cloud, the project I maintain. It's also a CNCF project, uh, Wasm Worker Server. Uh, it's a project out of VMware, and these are things that are running like an application level thing with WebAssembly. So you're going to see a lot of these around here, but they're actually running in production right now. Now, the main point we need to understand is how should Wasm integrate with what we have right now? And that was the whole impetus of this talk. Okay? It's cool. It's emerging. People are talking about it. Like any new hyped technology, it's the best thing since sliced bread. But how does it actually integrate with the stuff now? So first things first, we need to understand where we came from to, to see why WebAssembly is important and where it's going. So back when we first started building essentially data centers, right, we had everything on bare metal. You had a single blade, which was your computer, and on that you had an OS with all the libraries that you needed for your applications that you're running and an application on top of it. That was your bare metal kind of setup. But then we moved on to something a little bit better, right, virtual machines. And virtual machines made it so you could run multiple operating systems and libraries and applications per physical unit of compute. And on top of that, we built Kubernetes. 
and containers and those kind of things. Like if you're not using Kubernetes, actually, out of curiosity, how many people here use Kubernetes? I'm assuming most people here. Okay, that's good. Whew, I was going to be worried if that wasn't the case because, I mean, then this talk wouldn't be very useful. But um, on top of that, we built containers, right? And that just abstracted away the OS layer part, and you, you, gr you grouped your libraries and applications all together into a container image. Now, none of these things obsoleted anything else before it, right? Like bare metal, you still have a physical server somewhere. And you're probably running on a virtual machine at some point. And then there's containers that you can build on, or and, and things you can build to any of these layers depending on your need. So the next layer is WebAssembly. And in this example I'm giving here, something like Wasm Cloud, which is an application level platform, you're able to take these things and run what are called components, which we'll go over in a little bit. And these completely decoupled the libraries and the application logic from each other as well. And so we're just getting smaller and smaller. It's, it's essentially like virtualizing a CPU or, or a process almost. And so these are just kind of a stepping stone of where we've been going, to, going over the past 20, 30 years you know, in cloud computing and where, where it's headed. And so understanding that, let's talk a little bit about WebAssembly and containers. So when containers were created, and the reason we all kind of bought into it, the big arguments were that it was small, right? They were a lot tinier than trying to spin up a VM or a big VM image. They were cross-platform and language was the argument. Uh, you could just put anything into a container, share it with somebody else, and have it run. I think we all had that moment when we first started playing with something like Docker, and you had a friend, and they wrote something, and they gave you that container, and then you ran that same container, and you didn't have to do anything else. And I think we all had that aha moment. It's also sandboxed, and it has fast startup, especially in comparison to something like a virtual machine or bare metal. So that's where Wasm comes in. So Wasm, you're going to notice a lot of the same benefits, but it's actually even smaller. So WebAssembly is um, often a tenth of the size of an equivalent container. And I'm talking about a well-maintained container. You're using DistroList or Scratch or something along those lines, and then putting in your application. It's even smaller than that. Most of the time, web, a, a chunky WebAssembly binary is megabytes. Um, and I'm talking single digit megabytes most of the time. So we're, we're talking very, very small. They're also actually cross-platform in language. We like to tell ourselves that Docker does that. It's a lie. And anyone who's actually done Docker long enough knows that. You have to build a custom image for each and every architecture you're going to run on. That's not actually cross-platform. That's just convenient packaging. Um, and so WebAssembly is actually cross-platform in language. You build it from any, if you build, it's a polyglot thing. It can build from pretty much any language and then take that output and run it on any system. And so it's actually more towards that right once run anywhere that people have always wanted. It's also, a, I say this kind of tongue-in-cheek, sandbox for realties. Um, you're, you're not relying on C groups or a Linux-specific thing here. Um, and that's the other thing why it's actually cross-platform, because you're not relying on those, like a Windows container does not look anything like a Linux container. And in this case, we're not relying on those primitives. These are entirely sandboxed um, by default. They do not get anything. If you get a WebAssembly binary, it's just a comp compile target, it literally can do nothing unless you explicitly allow it access to do something. And so that's kind of the model. Um, it's a capability-driven model. So we're used to this on our phones nowadays. Can this app have access to a microphone? Can this app has, have access to this? That's the kind of model that WebAssembly has. And it's also much faster startup than even containers. It essentially solves the cold start problem because the first time you, you start it up, you're paying a very small, I believe it's microsecond penalty. And then, at, sorry, after that, it's a nanosecond kind of thing. It's very, it's very fast. I don't know if it's actually nanoseconds or small microseconds. I haven't looked at those benchmarks in a while. But it's extremely fast. And so you're starting to see that, there, um, that there's some other benefits to WASM itself. Now, one key point here. These are infrastructure primitives. If you think about it, this has nothing to do with an application, right? There's how fast it runs, how small it is, where it runs. All those things are outside of the purview of most applications. Sometimes those do matter to certain applications, but for a lot of cloud applications, that doesn't matter. And so this is the first important point to realize. These kind of things about core WebAssembly are infrastructure primitives. And so you're probably thinking at this point, hey, so Wasm's a faster, more secure container. Is that what you're saying? Kind of. It can be, for sure. But if this were all that WebAssembly did, what I just showed you, then yes, all it is is a faster, more secure container. But it's not. 
And that's what we, or I was talking about when I started referring to components. So the component model is a standard. It's part of the W3 standards track, W3C standards track. So it is an entirely open thing. It's not something that any one company is doing. In fact, it has very strict requirements about how each thing um, advances through each phase. Now, at the core of it is something called WIT, which is what you see here on the right. That stands for WASM Interface Types. This is a syntax. You can think of it almost kind of like an open API definition. It's not the same, but it gives you concrete types that you're referring to. And so I'm able to define things like enums, and I'm using built-in types like strings and lists and, and um, saying that it can return an error or whatever it might be. All of those things are expressible. This is an example of what a key value interface looks like. Um, so you start defining things via interfaces, and everything is interface driven. Something that might be helpful at this conference in particular is how many people know when I say the Unix philosophy what I mean? Okay, so it's the idea you have like, I, I can curl, pipe it into um, sed, and then pipe that into t, and then pipe that into whatever I need to do to continue to go through, right? So you have little individual things that can be put together and they each do one thing well. The problem is we don't actually see that a lot in software outside of the actual Unix command line. And if you've done this a lot, you're like, well, why not? Well, it boils down to two reasons. Number one, it's unidirectional, right? You can only pipe from thing to thing. It's not like a, a call and a response. You need bidirectional communication. And it's unstructured. It's just strings, pretty much. I mean, it can be bytes, but let's not go down that little rabbit hole. Um, so there's, there, it's essentially strings. The component model takes the same idea, right? It's small, reusable pieces that can be composed together with a bidirectional communication and strictly typed things. So when we do this, everything can be interface-driven development, which means you're taking something and saying, if you satisfy this interface, then I can use you. And you, you start to break down, you start to see where you can break down library things. A lot of times developers don't care if they're going to talk to Redis or talk to Dynamo or talk to whatever, they just want to talk to a key value store. And if that's behind an interface, that allows a lot more flexibility. Um, and I'm going to talk through each of these, like what, what is an SDK for free and virtual platform layering? So all that a WASM component is, is just a, this wonderful little wrapper of metadata that goes around it that gives it concrete types. Everything else is plain bare WebAssembly. That's something a lot of people go like, well, how is it different? And is there more? It's the same thing. Underneath, it's, it's still all WASM. But WASM by itself is, as we've liked to call it before, a bunch of numbers in a trench coat. Um, it's a bunch of I32s being passed around. This gives us actual concrete types. Now, the SDKs for free part, this is where we start to, uh, Kubernetes is a great example of this. If you were around for the first part of Kubernetes, there was this time when really the only SDK was Go. And then every other language had to create their own, and every other language is slightly different or missing this feature, or have, and there's this big compatibility matrix. It's a nightmare. If that were behind an interface, what it allows us to do is reuse that code. So in this example I have up here, I could write performant code in Rust, or something that I really care about because I like Rust. But I could consume a, a Kubernetes API, like I was saying, that was written in Go over an interface. And these things can be composed together. And so what happens is, like a real, a real example of this is you have, um, let's say I have this component. Underneath here, these are just a bunch of interfaces that I'm using. I could be using IO or file system or whatever it might be. And this is where you also get to the idea of like service chaining or virtual platform layering. If I, as a platform operator, receive this component from, some, from one of the developers at a company, I can say, I know exactly what this thing needs. No, I don't want you using IO primitives directly. I want you using something that's auditing it, whatever you want to do, injecting it in. And you're not going to actually get access to the file system. I'm going to give you an in-memory scratch space for you to use. And your environment variables, they aren't going to come from the machine. I'm going to virtualize those away and give it one that foo equals bar, or whatever it might be. And so what happens is it run, before I run it, I can click that together, and it becomes a new component. So you're able to basically mix and match and plug and do whatever you need to do to make these things work together. If you have a newer version of an interface, you can literally plug into the old one and adapt it to the new one. All of these things are, are very powerful tools for building applications. And so coming back to this, that's what we kind of reviewed all those, this interface-driven SDKs for free virtual platform layering. That's what the component model lets you do. But one important thing to note, 
These are application platform primitives compared to what we talked about before where they were infrastructure level primitives. They're two very different things and that is key to understand what we're going to talk about next. So if you wanna learn more about components, that's a whole talk. I could talk for the whole time I have allotted on them. This is a QR code that links to a talk by Luke Wagner, who was the guy who actually invented WebAssembly and um, gave a great talk last year at WasmCon on what components are, how they work. Great, great talk, worth watching. Putting it up there because I don't wanna have to give the whole talk right now. So take that as a good reference for later. Now let's move on to the elephant in the room. So I already asked you all, you're all doing Kubernetes and we know that for better, for worse, if you are deploying something in production right now, you're probably touching Kubernetes somehow. Even if it's not all the time, it's at least part of the time. And for a lot of people, it's almost all the time. So that brings up the question, what's the proper way to integrate in with Kubernetes? So let's talk about extending Kubernetes for a bit. I mean, don't worry, this is going somewhere. It might feel like whiplash. We're just talking about the component mod and you're like, whoa, where's he going? This is important. So this is the diagram I took without the, the legend for it from the extending Kubernetes page in the Kubernetes docs. There are, count them, seven different ways you can extend Kubernetes. And that is part of what makes Kubernetes so popular is you're able to go through and extend it in any way you choose. Now, ultimately, the de facto way to extend Kubernetes that most platform operators expect is via a CRD and some sort of controller operator. That's just, that's just what it is. Now, I have a hate-love relationship with, with CRDs. I mean, I can go on, I can, I, I have, there's previous works I have written, you can go read if you wanna see my opinion on them, but it doesn't matter what I think, this is what people have settled on using. And it, it is a very powerful primitive, but it's really important to note with this extendability, there's, there is a flow chart. This is also from the docs. And there are a bunch of ways on here, but most of the time, you have to choose one of these extension points. That's the way you choose to do it. And it's, it is complex, but pretty much people center on CRDs, or sometimes you get things like webhooks or aggregation APIs or other things, which are kind of just often attached to a CRD of some kind. So with that in mind, there's a problem here. This is probably the spiciest take of the whole talk, so bear with me if you think it is super spicy. Um, Kubernetes is for containers. Full stop, end of story, caveat emptor. There is, it is not meant for other types of workloads. Right here on the right is yield deployment. We all recognize this. We all know what it looks like. And you'll notice that there is absolutely nothing here that helps me express these application platform primitives that the component model does for you. Things like, oh, this interface links to this interface, or I want to take this thing and combine it with this thing, or and all of those things are not expressible within Kubernetes. Kubernetes expects everything to look like a container. I know this because I started writing, when I first started doing Kuber, uh, Wasmon Kubernetes stuff, there was a project we, call, we wrote called WAC, Wasmon Kubernetes, that tried to do this from the, um, from the uh, CRI level. And then there was Crustlet, I, and I, like, that was basically a rewrite of the kubelet. I can tell you all sorts of horror stories about that. But the thing is, is no matter what you do, you have to make it look, it's a, it's a square peg in a round hole. It has to be containers. It expects everything to be containers. And you could change that, but it'll take five, 10 years minimum to be able to do something like that. And that's my point. Wasm plus the component model can do so much more for both platform engineers and developers. And so your tool that you use should support those kind of use cases. Here on the right is something called a WDAM manifest. This is something that we wrote because it doesn't, it doesn't exist yet. And this is the Wasm Cloud Deployment Manager. It's using a very Kubernetes similar manifest, that's on purpose, to share like, oh, hey, here's this image that I'm using, which is pulling down a WebAssembly component. And I'm going to link it with an HTTP component and a key value component. And it's showing all these different things that connect it all together. Now, in the examples I'm showing, it doesn't matter if this is the way you want to go. I'm showing it because this is what one open source project is doing, but any type of open source project could be doing with the component model in the future. And tools need to be able to support those things. Kubernetes does not have the primitives to support those things. So that brings me to this uh, thing that I had called wrapped versus alongside. 
So you'll notice right now in the community there are two different kind of competing models. Um, I don't mean competing is actually the wrong word. Two different models and how these are, are being done. The first thing is this wrapped. Now this is the run WASI project and things that use run WASI or the container D shims, which run WebAssembly essentially through the Docker container D API. Um, or just not Docker, the container D API underneath the hood. And essentially what that means is you are shoving your container or your, your WebAssembly module into the container shaped hole and making it run as if it were a container. And so you can get interesting workloads where a pod can be just containers, a pod could be all WASM, a pod could be WASM and containers, um, all in the same thing. And so this is entirely wrapped by it. And we'll talk, I'm gonna show how these contrast and kind of talk about the pros and cons in a second. Um, the next method is alongside, which is the method I was sh I'm going to show as well that uh, WASM Cloud uses. And that's the idea of what is Kubernetes good at? Kubernetes is good at running infrastructure. If you're running applications on top of it, you're probably, or if you're not, you should be doing it through some sort of application platform thing that you have built on top of it. Whether that's through gluing together cloud native tools or whether that's building your own, I've seen it all but it's really good at running infrastructure. It's been good at that since the beginning. And so that's what we use it for. Container, we run inside of a container, the Wasm Cloud host, which runs our WebAssembly components. But what's nice about this is you can actually bridge between multiple Kubernetes clusters because Wasm Cloud is something that allows you to do distributed application platforms via Wasm. So you can have components running wherever you want. Everything's a flat network topology and I'll show that live in a second. So that means I can bridge from, you know, something like my two Kubernetes clusters that I have running out to the edge or to an on-prem data center or any of these kind of flexible options. And once again, it's what we're doing, but you, there are many other things you could do with a component model where you might need to hook it into other things that aren't necessarily Kubernetes or across multiple Kubernetes clusters. So let's go to the demo. So I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna show two, both examples. I'm gonna start with wrapped, and then I'm gonna to go to uh, the alongside options and show this live on here. Now I'm keeping the example simple. Both of these are going to involve a key value database um, and a simple one. I mean, we're going drop dead simple. So first thing I'm gonna show is, uh, sorry, let me embiggen this. Okay, there we go. Now everybody can see it, right? Good, people can see it, okay. Um, so uh, the first thing I'm gonna show is probably the most mature of the different run WASI options, it's called SpinCube. And SpinCube, what it does is does this wrapped thing. Underneath the hood, it is swapping out your runtime or having a runtime installed alongside, which either has to be installed with a custom node image or via some sort of controller or operator that can, has the admin permissions to swap out the underlying thing and add in what's called a runtime class. Um, so what that does is it makes it for a, makes it able to, you're, you're able, in this case I'm using a CRD to deploy it and eventually it deploys a pod. And so the pod um, is right here. I'm gonna actually take this and show you what it looks like. So uh, right up here, you'll notice that this looks pretty much like a normal pod. We have this thing that says, oh, spec containers, here's the name of the thing I'm pulling. Um, and here's the, Im or here's the image I'm pulling, here's the name, all the stuff you'd normally expect to see. The only thing that's different here is you have this runtime class that's needed. So this runtime class is, is how you indicate, oh, I'm going to use a different, essentially, container runtime is what it thinks it's doing. Now, this is all, in this is all inside of the cluster and I'm able to go through and I actually have um, just a, a little client here and I'm gonna publish, I was doing this Hello World just to make sure it was working, you know, on the conference Wi-Fi. And I'm gonna say like, oh, hello OSS, sweet. So then I'm able to come in here to, and get the logs, and you'll see that I just got that hello OSS. Okay, so I just basically keyed off of a, a key value watch and then put it inside here. And this application is written in WebAssembly. I can run the same thing locally, I can run the same thing elsewhere, but it looks just like a pod. So that's the, that's the first option. Now I'm going to switch over to the alongside version. Now, um, this is with Wasm Cloud. And we have a tool called the Wasm Cloud Operator. And the operator does exactly what I was showing in that diagram. You're able to say, spin me up X amount of hosts inside of my Kubernetes cluster, and then connect those to whatever, with whatever options I give to you. And I'll go ahead and actually switch uh, my context. Um, okay, so I'm gonna swap to this. 
And actually, first things first, I'm going to show you all of the hosts I have running in my, in my um, what we call a lattice or a cluster. Not wash app, sorry, wash get inventory. So wash is a command line tool we have for Wasm Cloud. And right here, I'm actually gonna show this. So we have my laptop, this one right here, running on conference Wi-Fi, connected to a Kubernetes cluster running in GCP in US West, and then connected to a uh, to an AKS cluster running in Brazil. All is part of the same cluster. Now, you probably wouldn't have a setup exactly like this. I'm just showing it to show what this can do. So all of these are essentially the same cluster for my compute. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, go ahead and I, I already started up one example, a, a key value counter, very similar to the other one. It's just gonna, I can curl an endpoint, it increments a key value store. Now the database is running on my machine right here, and right now I have everything running on my machine. And you can actually see that right up here. I have um, this host inventory right here, and it says, oh, here's hello world, um, and it's running my KV counter, and I have Redis, and I have HTTP server, and it's all running on this machine. So what I'm able to do is I'm able to do curl, um, so I'm gonna curl the foo key. And so you can see, woo, I'm incrementing a counter. Like I said, the examples are just too simple to keep, this, to keep this demo simple, but you can do a lot more complex things than this, which I can show you after if you're interested. But I'm able to increment a counter here. And you're like, great, okay, you're running something on your laptop, Taylor, that's not that impressive. Well, this is where I show you why, why it matters. So we have a WDAM manifest like I showed you before. So I'm gonna actually show you that one. Um, I have a distributed one. So I have a new version. And over here, we're gonna actually scale this out so that these things are running. I'm gonna have my, my actual business logic, the thing that's incrementing the counter and everything, living in Azure. I'm gonna have my HTTP servers running everywhere, including inside of GCP. And then I'm going to have the uh, Redis connect, like capability, the, the interface that it's offering, be running on my machine. So this is a proxy for your local data center or whatever it might be where you're storing your on-prem data. And so now I'm able to take this and deploy it. And what's nice is because we integrate in with Kubernetes, you can deploy this with our tooling, but you can also just do kube control apply dash F, Oops, let me get the Y, dash F, bottom distributed. And so this will actually apply the manifest just like you'd expect with anything else. And now it's configured it. So it, it patched this application for everything, and now it's running across two Kubernetes clusters and this simultaneously. Essentially, we, when we created this, we unintentionally solved Kubernetes Federation because you can run the same application across all your clusters if you so desire. So we'll give that a second to run, um, given the, the fact I'm conference Wi-Fi, you know. I, I like to live, live it dangerous here. We're gonna see if this, uh, this did it. Okay, yeah, you're starting to see it distribute all out. So we have Azure stuff running, we have all these different things running. So now I just distributed this completely out. So now I'm gonna switch context over to my GKE cluster. Give this a second. I couldn't keep this running, so you're gonna to have to watch it. This is gonna be proof that I'm running a live demo. I'm gonna apt install curl on a Debian image, so you know I'm not just faking this out. Okay, we're gonna hopefully get to this. I'm, I'm hoping it'll work over the conference Wi-Fi. Sometimes it's a little bit funky. If not, I can still show you something else, but while that's going, let me show you this. So I can say kube control get services. Oh, yep, the Wi-Fi is. Let me switch back. That's probably why it's giving me problems. Okay, yeah, it did work over here. So something is wrong with my conference Wi-Fi connection, but essentially what happens is automatically I can get a service created because I updated that. So now this will look just as if it were any other service running inside of Kubernetes. It has the name that it got from my application manifest. It has an IP address inside of the cluster, and I'm able to go into that and actually run 
yeah, it looks like I was able, unable to actually connect. So let me try that again in the Azure cluster and see if it'll let me do it. But essentially what I just did was connected this, this all across these different things and still exposed it inside of Kubernetes. Okay, here we go, apt update, apt install curl. Forgot the why. So what I'll do now is actually curl from inside of this cluster. So I'm accessing this just like I would in any other pod, and I'm going to call foo, and we're going to, yep, and there you go. So that is traversing through Kubernetes to code running Kubernetes to a database on my laptop and back into the thing. So I'm able to build a much, it gives me much more flexibility in how I distribute these things, and I'm still able to use all of the existing tooling and things that I have. I just kube control applied the manifest, which means you're also able to connect into things like uh, Argo or Flux or whatever. Now this is an example actually from a community member, Machine Metrics, that l the QR code leads to a link at the, of a talk they gave about this. They run things on factory floors. And because we do it in this method, they're actually able to spin up Wasm Cloud wherever they need it in their satellite regions, which is what you see in the left, and it goes all the way down to showing the WDAM manifests that they're running. And what's nice, because we will always integrate in like this, if someone comes up with a better manifest format for how we're expressing things than what we did, great, we can use that. All of these things are perfectly extendable. So like to show you what this kind of looked like, we had my laptop and then we connected everything together. If, if you're more of a visual learner, this hopefully can help. But I had things running on my laptop connected to Redis. And then I had things running outside in pods in two different Kubernetes regions that could then connect back to it. So let's start wrapping this all up. What are the pros and cons here of each approach? So with the wrapped approach, one of your main pros that you probably figured out just from looking at it is it's very native Kubernetes integration. It looks like it's a normal pod. You're essentially not changing anything but a runtime class. And honestly, you can replace containers in many different uh, use cases with it, especially for like microservice type things. Now, um, I, I personally can see use, use cases for this, but there's some big cons to this as well that I really want to drive home. It requires custom node builds or controllers. If any of you are SREs, if someone came to you and said, hey, I'm going to install like something in your runtime level, you're going to be like, whoa there. And who knows what kind of security red tape you're going to have to go through to get that installed. Even if it is a trusted thing and a trusted project, there's always the, those, pro, those things. The way I think of it, too, is if, if you're a, uh, an enthusiast running a Raspberry Pi cluster of Kubernetes at home, so now you have to go replace your kubelet image that you're running on every single node. Um, that's a very uncommon way of extending Kubernetes. If you were familiar with those diagrams I showed early from, earlier from the extending Kubernetes, um, documentation, nothing in there says extend container D. In fact, we know this because there are other container runtimes, cryo, podman, those kind of things. And how often are those actually used outside of the custom Kubernetes distributions like OpenShift and all that? Almost never for the same reason. You don't normally swap out the lower level runtime. You just stick with container D. It also lacks the full extensibility of the container model. Uh, or the component model when you're acting as a container. So what happens is you are now, because it's that square peg in the round hole, you are inheriting all the baggage that comes with Kubernetes. You're not allowing yourself to extend beyond it, which is what the problem most people have with Kubernetes. They're happy with the stuff it does well, but then they try to go run it on an edge device, or they try to go run it on a, on a cell tower, or all these things. And people are like, I don't have the time or energy or resources to actually spin up a whole Kubernetes cluster in each of these locations. And then you have to have manifests that get applied to the different locations separately. You're just opting into all of those problems. There's a reason why Kubernetes doesn't run outside of a single region and essentially the same data centers in the same region. And so you're opting into all of that. And that is a massive con because yes, we're, we, know that, we know that there's new things, but also by opting into that, you're, you're basically attaching yourself to the past. And this is why I'm talking about minding the gap. That will latch you to the present instead of helping you bridge to the future. Now alongside, the pros are it can be added to any cluster that allows CRD installations. 
And that's an important point, because pretty much every company I've talked to, they have some sort of process for installing a new CRD. It might be heavy, there might be bureaucracy there, invo there and involved, but there is a process to install a new CRD. You don't need to change out your underlying nodes, you can just install it on top. And like I said, it bridges to these new types and styles of deployment. You're trying to get out to the edge. You're trying to get things out of the cloud to reduce your costs, whatever it might be. It's also fully extensible using the component model. Everything I was showing was a component, meaning you can take it out of Wasm Cloud and run it somewhere else, which is a key goal of the project that we're trying to always maintain. Now, there are some cons. It requires building and understanding a new paradigm. You have to understand the component model. And we understand that that's a challenge but we feel that that is a better way to have this bridge across to the things that are existing now than trying to latch yourself to the past. And the other important note there is that the unit of distribute here is a component, not a pod. So your, your unit of compute is now, your unit of distributing is these components you build, not the actual containers or pods that you're delivering instead. Now, to sum that all up, this is how I feel about it. We have to be able to bridge the gap between the present and the future if we really want WASM to reach its full potential. Sticking with the past sounds nice for the first little bit, but even then it's hard to kick the tires seeing how you install those things and get them started. We're not saying, and nothing we're doing in this is saying, you need to abandon everything you've done. We want to work, we know everyone spent millions and billions of dollars trying to get compliance things in place and security pipelines and build pipelines and all the stuff on Kubernetes. We're not saying abandon that, we're saying bridge it to the future. Leave yourself open for options that allow you to bridge out when Kubernetes doesn't fit your use case or even if you're just gonna stay in Kubernetes, that you don't have to manage all these these clusters and apps running across them as separate entities. It's the, really the only way that lets us take advantage of all these application platform primitives that the component model enables. So with that, and as I said, I would give us time. We have four minutes for questions. So any questions from people? They're in the back. I would chuck this to you, but does someone want to run this for me? I, I, can, I can speak loud enough. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll repeat it on the, go ahead. to fetch those things and modularize that. Yeah, so for those who are watching this streamed or later, the question was, what's the discoverability of the components? How does it know, like in my example, how does it know where to find the Redis part and the HTTP part? Great question. So there's a couple different ways that this is done. And right now I'm working on a standard with the WebAssembly working group um, that's part of tag runtime in the CNCF. And we're almost done defining a standard for an artifact format in OCI that will contain this information that can be used by anything that wants to index it. There's also a cool tool called um, wa.dev um, that is a, there's a WebAssembly specific registry that's really trying to solve this discoverability. And that is the future we're heading towards is, it's more of like a global marketplace. I'm gonna say that really hesitantly because marketplace can mean anything to anybody. But what you're able to do is say, okay, I have a component and I need something that gives me key value and gives me a blob store. What do you have available? And then be able to take those things. So that is there right now. It is a little bit clunky right now, I'm not gonna lie, this is still new technology, but it is definitely searchable. So I can be able to come here and say like key value and I think this will work. We're gonna see if it'll, no, it hasn't done that one yet. We'll do HTTP because I know that one's there. Perfect, okay, so I have WASI HTTP. I can start searching for things. This actually gives me even the documentation of the interface that it comes through, um, and you're able to search for those things. And so this stuff is going to be available through OCI as well, and I'm, I was specifically working on this with other people in the community because, once again, you probably already have SIG store, Wrecker, whatever it might be, all set up. We don't wanna make you reinvent the wheel. <laughs>